What you're looking at here is perhaps the bastard stepchild of both the Silicon Graphics hardware line and also the late 90s to early 2000s x86 Windows workstation market. This is the Silicon Graphics 320, or what happens when a company that mainly made money on proprietary workstations decides we need to make an x86 workstation, but we're not going to do it like those other guys are. No, we're going to do it our way. We're going to do it the SGI way. We're going to make this custom workstation that is not like any other PC at the time. And needless to say, it was such a flop that when Silicon Graphics replaced it, they replaced it with generic x86 workstations made with off-the-shelf hardware. But at least it has a nice little front panel. A front panel that slides down when you push on it. And it's a nice little parlor trick. So basically, like I said, the thing with this system is it was made in the late 90s when Silicon Graphics wanted to get a foothold in on the x86 workstation market that was clearly booming. I mean, many of their competitors either were building these or they were eventually going to build these. Sun eventually went into that market. Um, DEC was in that market already. They were already building PCs. HP and IBM obviously built PCs at the time. So, basically, this system was Silicon Graphics' answer to that market. And it didn't do quite well for a lot of reasons I'm going to get into. But, as we can see, it looks like a, a nice Silicon Graphics Unix workstation, except for this thing right here. Intel Pentium 3. And that's when you know this is PC-based in a lot of ways as well, but it's also not PC-based. Because if I were to describe this thing, I would describe it more akin to sort of a, an early 80s PC clone that wasn't quite compatible, or the NEC PC98 line. And I think that's a great way of describing this, because I'm going to take a look at the back of this system, and what's inside of it now. So taking a look at the back, we can see there's a missing screw, which I'm going to have to eventually replace. There's two big fans. One of them is the power supply fan. One of them is the main system fan. And it looks really nice from the back as well. In fact, there's also a little lock door, and it's not in all the way, so I can't shut it. This thing is a pain to put back together, by the way, just because the door doesn't like to go in all the way. But right here we can see what's on the back. There's an Intel Ethernet port. And there's a port for the SGI, I think it's the 1600 SW, I think that's the name of it. But it was this proprietary LCD SGI made. And only two systems were compatible with it. The O2 with a special card and this system out of the box. Needless to say that LCD was a flop, but... That LCD did gain a cult following for a while, and this was one of the few systems that could use it. But if you don't have one of those LCDs, and chances are you don't, there's a plain old LCD and CRT VGA port as well. I mean, lots of things still have those ports. You can plug this into any old monitor, and it'll work. There's a parallel and serial port. There's your USB ports. And here's an interesting curiosity. You see this FireWire port? One of them's taped up. I mean, you can even... You can feel where it was at. And that's because these systems had issues with the FireWire port drivers. And you'll notice this is a running theme with this system. This system had buggy FireWire ports, so SGI solution was to tape up one or two of the ports, I think it was one of them on later builds, and they shoved this factory OEM FireWire USB combo card in the system. And this was their solution. Well, if, if our FireWire port doesn't work, let's just give customers a, a PCI card and take up one of their slots. That, that's a great fix for this solution, courtesy of SGI. There's our SCSI port. And then right here, we've got 
um, aside from our normal PC ports, there's no PS2 ports, there's USB ports for the keyboard and mouse, which makes this USB card more useful. And by the way, all these ports I think are 1.1, so good luck copying a file off a flash drive. There's these AV ports. Now this is the coolest feature of the SGI 320. These AV ports are capable of 1080, well they're not capable of 1080p, they're capable of 480i only. 480i only, nothing else, no 240p, just 480i. And then there's also RS video ports. But these AV ports can do capture, they can do video capture from the input port. And it looks pretty great for its time. I mean, nowadays you could get better quality from a cheap used Hapage or Blackmagic design card on eBay that can do component, and it looks much more crisp from that thing capturing component. But this was the late 90s, and so this actually looked amazing for its time. It's similar to the hardware in the O2, and in fact, I actually used this years ago as a capture device because it could do a great job capturing gameplay footage. Of course, you'd have to hook this big-ass computer up and a monitor up to it, and then you'd have to either play your game through it or use a splitter, but once you did that, you could capture some great footage, and this did a great job at that. It was a great thing for capturing footage from these ports. Now, this Ethernet port, by the way, since we're talking about buggy stuff, it says in the README file, and I actually had this issue when I had this system set up the first time with the first Windows install, the Ethernet driver that comes with Windows 2000 is extremely buggy, and by that I mean it will drop connections, it will just free, it'll like stop transferring files all of a sudden, and it can be slow. And it, it's in the README file, it says this is a known bug, get an updated driver, and you have to download an updated Ethernet driver from SGI to get it to work. So the Ethernet port doesn't even work out of the box in Windows 2000. So once you take a look at the inside of the SGI 320, that's when the differences from this and a normal PC become apparent before you even turn the system on. So in here we've got a SCSI card, and this is great, especially if you're doing video capture. It's a QLogic SCSI card, and it's a PCI um, X card in the PCI X slot. But you'll notice one thing about the PCI slots, and that is they're 3.3 volts. Now, 3.3 volt PCI slots were uncommon at the time, and this means that 5 volt PCI devices with only one notch will not work. Now, as you can see, the uh, SCSI card actually has two notches on it, so it will work. But if it is a single notch card, it will not work. Right here is a Pentium 3 um, uh, 600 CPU. And if we zoom in, we can see that it is a uh, 100 front side bus model as well. So it's a 100 front side bus slot 1 CPU. This was common on systems that had Pentium 2s originally like this one did. They would These 100 MHz CPUs were popular for that reason. And they still kind of are on like eBay and whatnot, so they go for higher prices, but these uh, 100 megahertz front side bus models drop in easily to these slot one systems. Here we can see the chipset already has a bunch of heatsink chips, which is also uncommon, including a heatsink fan, which isn't the most common thing, but we really notice the weirdness when we look at the RAM. So the RAM is proprietary silicon graphics. It's like half a dim. And good luck finding RAM. But this silicon graphic system used this custom RAM format. And so if you wanted to run out to your local store or go online and just look for generic like SD RAM that's ECC like a lot of these systems took, you're not going to find that it'll work in this system because it has this weird half, um, half dimmed sort of thing. I mean, there's even only one notch. And it has this weird half dim thing for the RAM. Good luck finding replacement RAM for it. The hard drive is actually SCSI in this system, but it does have IDE as well. 
and I'm currently using an adapter board on a server drive. Now these adapter boards are pretty great for this purpose because you can just shove one of them in and you can get out of your system you can use a um, 80 pin drive on a 50 or 68 pin system like this is a 68 pin system as you can see goes from here to here and it can actually take two drives there might have been rails for this I don't know but it doesn't look like there have been rails and I just screwed the drives in I think that works so we've got our two Pentium CPUs here or one of them you can actually put two in but you need a, a special VRM that's right you need a special VRM and right here is a dummy terminator so we we can only use one CPU because we do not have that VRM you can put a uh, Celeron with a slocket in I mean I've heard of people using power leap slockets in these things but um yeah, here's our one 600 megahertz Pentium 3 CPU, and it's a slot one. So we've got proprietary RAM, we need a VRM here, but we do have an Intel Ethernet chipset. And so this system was inside, you could already see one thing. They were going all out on the proprietary. And here's another thing about this chipset. This system used a high-end for its time integrated graphics chipset. It was this custom silicon graphics chipset. And one of the things it did with the memory was it would actually share part of the memory. And I'll show this feature when I turn the system on. But it actually shares part of the this memory with the video chipset. Kind of like what modern chipsets do. It would do that feature but you'd have to tell it how much memory you'd want it to use. And this system was, it was also, like I said, because of the proprietary RAM, because of the onboard custom video chipset, this wasn't upgradable like the competition was. For example, that HP Visualize system I showed a few videos back. That HP Visualize system is a plain x86 system at its core. I mean, it's a workstation system, but at its core, you could take out the weird PA risk based GPU and shove in a faster ATI Radeon chipset GPU off the shelf. You could shove in a, a GeForce or Quadro chipset GPU that came off the shelf. You could shove those chips in here and it would work in the HP Visualize. You want RAM upgrades? You don't need weird ass SGI RAM. You could get off the shelf memory. Um, and it was a much better system with regards to upgradability because it was much easier to upgrade. And needless to say, there's a reason HP is still making workstations while Silicon Graphics got bought out by another company who got bought out by HPE recently. <laughs> so, like I said, this system was Silicon Graphics' first x86 workstation and it had its own weirdness with upgrading and all. And I haven't even turned the system on yet. Oh man, once you see the system running, you'll see how weird this thing is. At least it uses a coin cell battery though. But hey, on the other hand, how many other computers have onboard video capture? So let's go turn the system on. And as we can see, we're getting a flashing light, then it goes solid, kind of like some SGI systems would do. We can hear the hard drive spin up. And now we're getting a little black screen that, you know how some video DACs seem to have a very specific look to them? Well, this sort of has the same look older SGI systems did with like white balance and all. And so ROM BIOS is installed. This is the only BIOS-like thing you're going to see. You can actually set it to do full hardware tests and that takes longer. And right now we're at a, a boot up interface that looks very much like that of an SGI workstation. But, as we can see here, you know how Windows usually is a black screen where it's doing all that? Well, here it's kind of sort of like the whole idea with 
like some of the EFI systems or Lieber boot or that sort of thing where you get a BIOS based and or well in this case it's not BIOS it's ARC you get an ARC based boot menu and as we can see here advanced boot options and it looks just like a normal silicon graphics workstation right now it's got the same design same red mouse pointer you can even click around with it or you can even use number keys if you want just like on an SGI system but it's numbered like one two three four five six so if you hit two you're gonna get startup settings instead of install software we hit six we get our HINV so right here it says SGI 320 ARC x86 now there are actually two systems made using this oddball architecture the 320 and the 540 which was a bigger Xeon based system there is one flaw with these systems and you know what that is Windows XP was never supported see with this system Windows 2000 was the last supported OS there were two OS's there was a modified version of Windows NT4 and there was a newer version of um, Windows 2000. There's a newer version you could run called Windows 2000 of the OS and that was the only other version. You could run it with the retail disks instead of a custom version of NT4 where you had to use their disks and nobody's put those disks online so you're pretty much stuck with 2000. You need to do a firmware update to use 2000 but that's pretty much what you'd expect with a system like this. Now there are some things in common with the whole, uh, with other Arc Windows systems. For example, if we go to three, I mean, sure, we get all that basic stuff like the the typical BIOS stuff. But we go to five. We there's actually a partition disk option to make the system partition the system needs, and that's what some of these Arc systems had. Like the Alphas had this, you would have to make the system partition from the boot firmware and then you could load the OS when Windows would not make this partition for you by the way so you had to do it yourself you go to 4 it wants you to insert the installation CD kind of like SGI hardware had you do and in fact to be fair the same went with other SGI ARC systems it's just you had to load into IRIX via a command you type there's no command line interface to ARC, by the way, unlike on SGI hardware. So we hit Start System, and we can see Windows 2000 from the last few times 2000 was installed, and Windows 2000 IDE default in NT4. So basically, the system could run both, and that was the default in case nothing loaded. So we're going to load 2000, and as you can see, starting Windows appears in a blue boxed out area because that's kind of what Arc Systems did for text mode but then once it loads BAM the SGI 320 looks indistinguishable from every other computer ever made that could run Windows 2000 except for the fact that it has a workstation card permanently on the motherboard so OpenGL games Eh, some of them run, some of them have graphical glitches. Kind of like that HP I had when it had the HP card in it. So Quake 3 will run. And in fact, John Carmack actually owned an SGI 320 at one point. So Quake 3 will run. Some other games will run that are OpenGL. But Direct 3D games only run in software mode if they run. And so we've got Windows 2000 doing its loading. We've got the custom SGI wallpaper on here. And I can't get updates for this anymore because it's 2000. But um, I'm going to grab the mouse here. If I go do Windows Update. If I go to Windows Update. I'm going to grab this thing a bit better. It's going to give me this cannot be displayed message because Windows Update doesn't quite work on 2000 anymore but let's take a look at the interesting part of this system so um, we've got SGI 32540 ARCX86MP 
let's go to device manager and we've got a exclamation point for the frame buffer because that's that's kinda what this system does but this system has a custom silicon graphics video chipset called the cobalt and if we right click and go to properties like how it was with a lot of these old display drivers cobalt graphics we go to advanced and we go to silicon graphics display and settings and this is where we can choose how much video RAM we want to reserve. So if we go to default configuration, we can go to properties. And we can change our settings here. For example, default 2, that's the one I made. We go to properties. We can change all of this stuff, overlay planes, back buffer, how much VRAM we want, etc. Because it shares the VRAM. And that's why there's less than 256 megs of RAM in here as well. As for games, yeah, it'll run Quake 3. What do you expect? Anything can run Quake 3. What cannot run Quake 3? We can go to multiplayer. We can do single player. We can even uh You can just run around in a map and we can get an okay frame rate. We can run other games that are open GL too, but as John Carmack owned one, Quake 3 works the best and it actually works better than it did on the uh visualize by far. So this is actually uh, the Windows keyboard mistake. So this actually runs quite good for what it is. But the problem is A it was proprietary and B you couldn't exactly upgrade it. So these are default settings by the way. I haven't changed a single setting. So yeah. As we can see here this system runs okay I guess. And it also does the video capture. In fact, if we look in control panel, we can go to settings. It's hard to use a mouse one-handed. Yeah, we've got our SGI video and audio settings. You can actually record stuff with virtual dub. So yeah, all in all, Interesting part of x86 history, interesting part of workstation history, but it's just not as usable as you'd expect because of the OpenGL issue and the fact that it has issues with many games that are OpenGL. So yeah, that's all that needs to be said. Um, this was a quick video, sort of, on the SGI 320. And it's okay, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for watching and subscribe for more.